This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube, you should know that this program is also available on your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Jean-Christophe Maillet, who is a research professor employed by the French National Center for Scientific Research, or CNRS. He is also a member and the deputy head of the Institute for Research on the Renaissance, the Neoclassical Age, and the Enlightenment, or IRCL, at the University of Paul Valéry Montpellier III. We will talk about Jean Christophe's role in CNRS and IRCL, and also generally about his research, including his views on postmodernist theory, and also about his recent book entitled Shakespeare's Early Readers A Cultural History from 1590 to 1800. This talk is funded by the Aoyama Gakuin Information Media Center. This series has been maintained with support from the Aoyama Gakuin Institute of the Humanities and from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Jean Christophe, thank you so much for joining our little series here at Speaking of Shakespeare. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. It's it's our pleasure. The pleasure is all ours. And uh, I wanted to make sure that our audience knew who you are. You are a research professor employed by the French National Center for Scientific Research in, in English. The acronym for that is CNRS, CNRS. And you are also a member and the deputy head of the Institute for Research on the Renaissance, the Neoclassical Age, and the Enlightenment, IRCL. Again, that's IRCL at the University of Paul Valéry Montpellier III. Along with this administrative and research work, you have been the author of many articles and a book that I love uh, entitled Shakespeare's Early Readers, A Cultural History from 1590 to 1800. And that's out of the Cambridge Uni University Press. That's not your only book. But that's your most recent one. And yes. I'll get a chance to talk about that. And I certainly want to insert your work in Japan, seeing as we're in Tokyo. I'm in Tokyo now, not we, but I'm in Tokyo now. And I have colleagues in the Shakespeare Association, uh, Shakespeare Society, excuse me, Shakespeare Society of Japan, and they will be very interested in the work that you've done at Mesa University. So let's start out with your work uh, as the uh, as a research professor and also as a deputy head. Yes. Um, well, I was recruited in two thousand um, as a as a as a junior uh, research professor. And and um, about ten years later, um, I got promoted to to what you would call either senior um, researcher or um, a director director de recherche, which um, in English was, would would um, translate as research professor. Yes. So in other words, I'm I'm very lucky in the sense that that. Um, and I, I, I realize that, that I am lucky because um, it's like the CNRS gives you so the, the centre, the centre, the National Centre for Scientific Research. I'm sorry, there's so many acronyms. The CNRS um, gives you the opportunity to um, um, carry out your your research without any teaching and for life. Um, <laughs> so, <I'm jealous. laughs> so as, you, as you can imagine places are, are quite hard to get and i didn't get in first time so just to reassure you uh, <laughs> um, and um, they, they are my, my main employer and they're um we are recruited in in paris and i know that the belgium has a, a similar um, organization called the f N R S, um, but I'm not sure it's it's for life. So um, it's it's like a, an endowed chair, but with without the money with it. <laughs> if yes. you see what I mean. Um, 
And so, um, yeah, it gives you a lot of freedom and also a lot of freedom to move around topics throughout your career. Um, not just stay, you know, as because um, I would say we um, lecturers, senior lecturers, professors, because I used to be a senior lecturer as well uh, in my early career, um, we are given so little time for research that we tend to research the same topic the whole of our career. Whereas for um, for really research professors, you you are um, able to change topics, and I've changed topics through throughout throughout my my career. But I I really um, well should thank the CNRS Antoine Petit who is the um, CEO of uh, the CNRS. And also I should mention my head, Florence Marc, uh, who is professor of uh, theater and English, or English and theater. And the, uh, the former head of my center, who is now Dean of Humanities and who, um, really um, transformed the center even more before Florence, even um, uh, before Florence came. And so, such a lovely person. And that's Professor Nathalie Vivienne Guerin. All right. So she's head of humanities. You are sponsored by the National center, but you also are part of this Institute for Research. And any directives or any types of mission statement or any current uh, involvements that you have in research, your own or some type of collaborative research, anything that you would like to let us know about that is going on there in Montpellier? Right. Well, we're, we're a center that, as you said, um, goes from the 16th century to the 18th century and includes a variety of, of, um, of specialties, um, such as we started first as a, an Anglo-French center with Anglo-French professors. And then um, we enlarged our field and um, we, we got uh, people, specialists in Portuguese. Um, we got people especially in in architecture 16 17, 17 architecture music even um so really we're a hub for uh modernity or early modernity our mission statement really was to look at the formation of modernity um whether the, you know the the term modernity is is used properly and what does modernity uh, entail, or what does early modernity entail? Um, hence, the you know the usual barriers between we're looking at the usual barriers between those uh, b between the, the centuries and um, and periodization in particular. Um, yeah. We um, were very much involved in that. As yeah. far as my general mandate is concerned, coming from the French National Center for Scientific, Scientific Research, well, that's quite simple. Uh, dépasser les frontières, which means going above, uh, going beyond um, borders, going beyond borders in science. Um, this is why I've, throughout my, my career, I've always tried to do things that, that my colleagues, for lack of time at university, um, could not do. Mm -hmm. And hence, I've, I've centered on, on quite in depth on um, topics such as Shakespearean religion, which involved a lot of work on, on Jesuit archives in particular. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, nobody, well, it would take a life, well, not a lifetime, but 20 years at least to to go into it, where it, it took me, well, about 10 years or a little less. And then, um, and then I moved on to um, uh, Shakespeare and in theory, you know, can we say that Shakespeare is postmodern uh, in, in many ways and to look at, at postmodern theory compared to, to, to Shakespeare? Um, other, of course, researchers have done that, but it, it really meant going through the whole corpus of, 
of Derrida, Foucault, um, etc., and um, and and look at and and pointing sometimes at how old-fashioned they are, <laughs> you know, compared to uh, current French research like um, uh, Antoine Compagnon's research, which is totally, I think, totally unknown um, overseas. My leading thread throughout my career has been um, uh, has been history and also the place of human beings in history. So, in other words, um, bringing back to life as much as I could um, uh, uh, the people who lived in, you know, their ordinary lives in 16th, 17th, 18th century, who had to suffer because of their religion. Um, and um, in the, the theory book, I... Um, I also look at I start looking at early modern readers because really I'm steering towards um, not a postmodern um, approach. So really, the, the the title is a little misleading, but uh, but but it, it's on purpose. Uh, <laughs> it's talking more about empirical uh, uh, readers, and and it's turned to really more um materialist history and i, I think that that um Foucault is a great philosopher but um a lot of french people would say in, in academia he's a lousy historian <laughs> well i uh, noticed i noticed this in your writing uh, uh, a while back and quite liked it you are critical of post-structuralism in the yes. sense that it does tend to levi levitate upon the uh, above the empirical evidence of the subject that it's dealing with and not look at the material base and i do think foucault could be a portal to that but probably more immediate would be uh wolfgang isar or hans yes. Gauss, the reception theorist uh, you have modified this idea of reception. I worked in reception, and I still do, uh, but uh, adaptation in in the sense of bringing forward bringing forward the details of readership, even down to a pen that you may find uh, somehow in a page of the first folio or a wine stain, perhaps, or I those did. kinds of things. Those kinds of things who reflect what we might call the actual reader or the actual time. But this goes, this expands beyond just the readers. It's, it's a, a material, basically, publishing, the uh, modes of production, that sort of thing. And uh, that's that's very strong in your book. I'm very happy to hear that the Institute really seems to have this material base, empirical base, that I yes. find to be interesting. I, maybe it bores some people. It never has me. And so... Uh, oh, well, we have a, a we have a slightly more, well, I'd say different. I'd say, I was going to say exciting, but, but I think it's different, really. Um, strain within the center, we have a very strong team of uh, which is led by Florence Marc, uh, mm -hmm. whom I, I've, I've already mentioned, the, the head, um, um, who is looking into um, the Avignon F Festival and festivals in the south of France and um, who works on on living on on, on living theater. Mm -hmm. and goes into schools, um, does outreach work into, into schools, into poorer areas of Montpellier, and, and gets students involved in, in that, and, um, and playing some extracts also of, of, uh, of, of Shakespeare. Um, and that's, um, that is one of our... Um, uh, we have also um, a very strong 18th century um, um, stream of research, um, which is philosoph philosophical, um, historical, but also um, we've recruited recently Professor Sophie Vassi, who is um, specialists in 
but in water and and taking uh, water. Um, so she's specialist of like uh, cities like Bath, um, etc. So she's very interested in again in the humane, you know, the the human element as well as the um, metaphorical uh, element. And she's a very dynamic person, very smiley, very dynamic person. So yeah, you you could say there are about four four very strong strains um, in in the center. As far as as my work is is concerned, well, yes, it is, it is true that it is um, my my book on theory was 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 a book on on anti theory really, <laughs> even though I tried to save some of the um, uh, some of the theory, but I I tried to also show that the the Derrida or Foucault contradicted themselves the i the the persons i insert in a certain way okay because like derrida saying there there is nothing outside the text i mean please <laughs> that always that always bothered me you know that always bothered me this is just uh but it's amazing how strong that holds even now even still um and i remember uh, some years ago at a Shakespeare Society, uh, Shakespeare Association of America uh, conference, we were doing historicism and uh, the panel was admonished by a professor for daring to go outside the text uh, and departing from yes. a formalist view. And I, I've just never, maybe I'm <laughs> not smart enough, I've never seen a text that has anything outside. It just belongs. It's in this huge current of everything else. I mean, as soon as it's printed, it's a historical document. You know, let's yes. just start there. Uh, so I don't know. I fought back a little bit, maybe, uh, and uh, that's good. I'm interested in the fact that the uh, this isn't done so much in the uh, what would we call it the Anglo tradition that the 18th century is broken into Enlightenment and uh, post uh, the uh, neoclassical. There's a distinction is made in the title between Enlightenment and neoclassical. So when I was studying 18th century, we all of that just was bunched together but you you see a distinction there and it, it is a french thing I, uh, you know we have to kind of defer to <laughs> you know, uh you know starting you know of course voltaire but i mean so many others yes yes uh, yeah we do have specialists uh, of the uh, the enlightenment i and a very distinguished specialist which uh, who is um um jean-pierre chandler who mm -hmm. was also a uh, full-time researcher like myself. Uh, so there, there are two of us for the moment. We're hoping to recruit more, but of course, these these posts are uh, are difficult to get, and and you, you get them nationally. Actually, it's a national uh, competitive exam, and because um, the area we belong to, the humanities. Um, uh, is I think the humanities is, is the largest of all um, institutes within the the national, French National Center for Scientific Research, but it doesn't get as many as it gets exactly the same number of posts as say um, I don't know uh, uh, mechanical science or whatever you know some. Where 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 there there are far fewer applicants and then the same number of posts. So really, it's it's a gigantic um, uh, section that we be we belong to, which is called Section Thirty Five of of the CNRS. And so um, we you know it, it really is daggers drawn when it comes to <laughs> to well, choosing. This is something that uh, is it, I will selfishly insert here. The, the, uh, the diminishing of the humanities uh, globally, really. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is the case in France. I know it certainly is the case in the U.S. and Canada. The, a few years back, I was invited to give a talk to a graduate class at uh, the University of Tokyo, and it was at their Hongo campus. And I'd been there a couple of times. I felt like I could find uh, where I needed to go, but I did check a map of the campus. It's right there at the uh, where you enter. And 
there were just buildings and buildings devoted to engineering and the sciences and everything else. And yes. it's this one little spot, this one spot that I in fact could not find that was the actual classroom in the their graduate program. And I don't think the University of Tokyo is different from anywhere else in terms of certainly national universities in Japan. But I think if I were to go to the the Ohio State University, I would see the same kind of map and so forth. And there are two things about that. Well, that's a shame. Number two is that I keep hearing on uh, news broadcasts and so forth how our young people are being indoctrinated uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, you know, Marxist or gender uh, uh, studies beliefs that, you know, they go to college. Uh, and, and I have all of these friends who graduated with degrees from STEMs, STEMs uh, programs throughout whatever the U.S., and not one of them ever has seen a gender studies program in their college career. They never saw that. And if they went now, I think they would probably take a couple of classes in uh, composition, maybe uh, writing and uh, maybe a critical critical thinking or something. But uh, the uh, the um, the um, the public imagination is that there's this there's this enormous influence that the humanities has on. Uh, young people that is largely negative uh, making them feel bad about themselves and i want to say no it's not that big there are not that many people in there and we would like it to get bigger and uh in by and large what most of us do are the kinds of things that we're talking about now we're looking at cultural history and we're trying to cross borders and and build on uh collaborative uh interdisciplinary uh research yes 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 well, the, you see, you mentioned the, the word in the interdisciplinary. Um, one of our goals, and, and one of the goals that, that um, has been given to us by the CNIS is to, but more generally, also by the university, which has its own research policy, um, Université Paul Valéry Montpellier III. One of the goals is, is to um, um, cross borders, as I was saying, but but also go from interdisciplinary um, to transdisciplinary in the sense that we we then have a chance. Of course, it, it cannot be decreed. You have to be very good um, in your field first of all to be interdisciplinary, as you know, mm -hmm. and and then as we say in French, si la mayonnaise prend, if the mayonnaise is, <laughs> is, is a success, um, if the mayonnaise is a success, then you can get some degree of, of interdisciplinarity and people start really finding links that, that, uh, that are not, not artificial at all. And, and then there's a further step that is transdisciplinarity which involves not only not, not only the humanities but but also the science the heart the, the sciences um and uh what we call the hard sciences uh if you 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 call them that in in, in sure. english but sure yeah 20 years ago say or 30 years ago nobody had thought of um because we were this was the reign of new criticism etc and the, the text for the text uh, uh, nobody thought of, of 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 linking up or har hardly anybody i should say to be fair um har uh, hardly anybody had thought of 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 linking uh, the humanities with medical studies mm -hmm. and now it's become an actual field a new field mm -hmm. of knowledge um so really that's our aim is to um create new fields of knowledge um and and it's a very difficult enterprise believe me um yeah. and it takes it takes time it takes individuals who work want to work together but ultimately this is what makes you know what the world <laughs> move on uh, uh, research uh move on um as well and um and and um opens up new areas of of pertinent and helpful um because we mustn't forget of course why are we doing this we're doing it not just for us but also for the general public 
Um, and uh, after all, we're doing it for the taxpayer, as we are reminded <laughs> every yeah. now and again. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, this is the ultimate, um, the creation of new fields. But that that's, we're trying, first of all, to be very good at our, our disi you know, disciplinary, on a disciplinary level. And then, um, and then, uh, and then to build, and we, we constantly have interdisciplinary uh, seminars during the week. We have at least three um, per week. Um, so that's a lot to organize, but we do have admin staff that, that are really very good. Um, Vanessa Cunerbla, um, in particular, our secretary who organizes these events wonderfully. And, um, and to pick up on, on uh, what you were saying earlier on, you were talking about Tokyo. The last chapter of, of, of my book on theory was, was on, on going back to the empirical and the material and, and, the, and the human. And it was on, on, on Shakespeare's, it was on readers, on Shakespeare's real, real, real readers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, not in the sense of, you know, Stanley Fish, is there a reader in, or is there, yeah, in this class? Is there a reader in this class? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, and so um, I went to, shortly afterwards, I went to, to the International Shakespeare Conference in Stratford upon Avon, and that's headed now by uh, Michael Dobson, as you, as you know. Yeah. And there I met somebody who, who eventually became a very, very good friend, and that's Atsuhiko Hirota from the University of Tokyo, maybe you know, you know him, uh, who is a professor there. And by and, reputation, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, and he was, he was so, so kind, but he said, do you know that we have more first folios than the British Library? <laughs> so, and, and also we, we have um, early modern documents um, at Meisei University, um yes. in tokyo yes so well i, I want to i want to interrupt just a moment and just finish sure. up with montpellier i don't oh I don't i'm think, sorry i well that's no no problem at all uh what i wanted to do is make sure that our uh, viewers and listeners know that montpellier is the perfect place for this type of research the town itself i've been there a couple of times three times in fact oh. on, my, on my travels uh because we, uh, my wife and I are are partially in Barcelona, and sometimes we just drive up the coast. And yes, and it's only a three-hour drive. Yes, you know, it's, there we are. And then beyond that, there's all of this stuff. It's just wonderful all the way through. But the <laughs> the town itself is just this perfect collaboration between old town and new town. You have the old city that uh, is very well preserved and very charming. And then you have the new, you know, the Olympic Training Center and so forth. That is just yes. one of the, the finest examples. I just, I told my wife, I said, man, when the French decide they want to do something right, they get it right. It's modern, the modernity is there, but also with a, uh, a bow as we're in Japan here and uh, a bow to the neoclassical roots of uh, the, uh, of, of of whatever, but it's just amazing uh, the uh, combination of old and new, and it sort of fits in with the research. But then let me—I'm sorry—that was sort of rude of me. But let's move no, on. No, to, no. Let's move on to Meisei University and some of the uh, things that you did. You were in Japan, and I just this is just—I I talked to people, and I realized they were here, and we didn't know each other at the time. But uh, you know, I'm right in the center of town. You know, I wish. I had a chance to meet oh, you. Oh, yeah, what a shame. Yes. But I, ac I, according to the acknowledgments in your book, and you do uh, acknowledge Noriko Sumimoto at Meisei and also Atsuhiko Hirota that you uh, have at Kyoto University. Uh, exactly. Yes. And so uh, you worked with them and I'm sure many others uh, at Meisei. And I am, you know, <laughs> sometimes foreign visitors, you know, I have semi-foreign status now. I've been in Japan so long, uh, but you get a, a bit more uh, access. You learn more uh, than those of us who are already in. And that includes some of my Japanese colleagues too. So we would love to hear what your experience was getting access to those vaults at Meisei and what you saw and what you experienced there. 
Uh, oh, by the way, this is the year of the first folio, the 400. It is. Yes, so yes. Is highly pertinent right now. And of course, the first folio was part of uh, your interest there, a large part. And But they have so much else there, too. Yes. And um, uh, it was Atsuhiko, actually, Atsuhiko Hirota, who actually um, put me in contact with Noriko Sumimoto, who is not only a an eminent professor of, of English, a paleographer, and who has set up a wonderful website where you are able to consult a number of first folio and also the, uh, the, the complete works of Ben Johnson in high resolution. So I, I encourage people to, to do that if they can't go to Japan. But really, if they can go to Japan, I um, would encourage them to go to Meisei's research library, um, which at the time when I went uh, for the first, the first time was called the Kodama um, Library, because this is a university that is very technologically bound. And that brings us back to what you were saying before mm -hmm. and the place of humanities. But this man um, behind his perhaps um authoritarian style of, of 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 governing his university at the time had a vision that you know he wanted he created this university and um he he being well um having well a lot of money he actually bought all the books at the right time that were on the market and 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 bought all the folio the first folios that were on the market because he thought okay we're going to start a department of english and so we need books and so and we need early books and so uh he bought all all the first folios so the 11 fourth first folios that, that were on, on the market he bought also some um uh quartos um by by shakespeare but also by other authors he bought some manuscripts and um and you know uh, uh, an incredible uh a treasure of um thanks to this man you know i know he's he's not very well revered now because he was um that's why the the uh, is no longer called kodama but that was his style at the time yeah. And um, but he he did have that vision, and not everybody would have that vision. Of, you know, creating a, a university. And I um, what I often often told when I go there is that he even even bought the Mary Curie manuscripts, which I'm told are still radioactive. <laughs> yeah. I, I just spoke with Eric Rasmussen, who was also in there, and he was concerned about that radioactivity oh, he's good, and so he's forth. He's a good friend, yes. yes, yeah. yes and uh, of course, you, yeah, I'm sure you uh, com communicate because you follow these things uh, where these first folios are going and so forth. And may say it's just uh, gotten rid of, uh, not gotten rid, sold off two of them, I think. And uh, yes, yeah, yes. Sadly, um, um, I was I was only aware of one that was sold. Um, only not one. M yeah. Yes, but but I, I could be wrong, of course. Um, but MR seven seven, the first folio that was is, which is, to my knowledge, the most annotated folio in the world um it has been preserved and is one of the treasures of of the um of the university library and also um it's 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 online so you you can have a look at it and uh, anybody can have a look at it and um and it's also been uh, transcribed um and, uh, and so there is no problem if you can't uh, decipher early modern writing. Um, but it's definitely one of the um, highlights of, of the library. So you are, yes, you are ushered in, you are given a mask to wear when I, when I, when I went there and you are given gloves and there, there's somebody who is there 
um, who, uh, who missed the Honda at that time, mm -hmm. um, who became a good friend, and, um, and, and uh, who oversees you, of course, because these are obviously priceless um, uh, documents. And um, and so I worked my way through with, I had a camera at the time, a DSLR, yeah. and um, I took, well, thousands of photos. Yeah. Of, I went through all of the collection, all of the Shakespeare collection, and, and took thousands of photos of, uh, of various things. Um, I think, I think um, things can be categorized in, in various ways. Um, you find traces of life, what I call life writing, that is to say what you were saying a, a while ago, uh, some wine spilled somewhere, or, or uh, tobacco uh, having burnt a page. Or a bullet uh, hole, a bullet hole. A, a bullet hole, <laughs> one of them that, that's been repaired, but yes, yeah. bullet hole will probably save somebody's life. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... Um, uh, yeah, a pair of scissors as well. The the left left its imprint. Um, it's no longer there, of course, but it, it left its imprint on on the page, and it was probably used as a bookmark um, as well. Uh, and you find an awful lot of drawings, yeah. and and um, and and that puzzled me for a long time. And that's what I'm working on more or less now. Is, oh, okay. Yes. Well, these, these signs of use in these books, and also there are other uh, many, of course, the, the signs of use are uh, extraordinary. And that's uh, basically that fits in with your, um, with your angle, let's say, of uh, wanting to find out more about the actual readers, the personalities. Of course, we can determine from wine and to, uh, maybe tobacco, uh, someone, their little burn marks and so forth. And I think you brought up the Samuel Johnson quotation where these people were, uh, probably didn't have enough time to read. So they're eating and uh, drinking while they're reading. And you can see <laughs> this. But it, it's, a, it's extraordinary. Uh, and of course, you bring up the you know the fabulous used books, the um, uh, the work from a few years back that um, goes into a lot of this and uh, marginalia, that sort of thing. Yes. So so yes, that, that was the other aspect. It was was looking at so the, the first one of the, the the main aspects, which of course was was quite attractive, was was um, finding. Finding traces of human activity in, in books that was that are so called you know the people would call dead books you know dead boring books well no they're not dead boring books at all and they have a lot to to reveal and uh, yes then I focused on marginalia and there's a lot of it and um, I had to I plowed through hundreds and hundreds of of not only in Tokyo but elsewhere. As you can imagine, I I I um uh, I should mention also a major influence, um, which was Bill Sherman's book, of course. Yes, used um, yeah. Well, which precisely was called used books. Used books. Uh, yes, yes. 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 So that, I, just, I, I remember the you know the picture of the hand, how the meticulous drawings were made. Exactly. The margins, uh, just brilliant yes. work. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you you find that also I mean it it's it's an old um it it really goes back to um a long long period because even even in in the late uh, middle ages monks were were drawing uh in in the margins um uh jokes and uh <laughs> whereas you know the, the scribe was was employed to uh to to write the book and sometimes illuminate it but or it would be given to somebody else I still wrote you know they, they have funny funny little figures as well um but um but really to to get more serious about it the um the, um, the marginalia yes um what came out of um my study of marginalia not only in Macy but but 
definitely a mainstay because this is where I I started, um, and then I I got a scholarship to a fellowship to go to a uh, long term fellowship to go to the Folger, and and then then I get my I got my what I call my critical ma mass, um, and then I went to other colleges as as you can imagine mm -hmm. um, in the UK and in the US. I went to the Library of Congress as well, um, and that was oh yes, right was, beside the Folger, right there. Exactly, just walk over. What a wonderful. Yeah, I'm yeah, really that, that was very exciting. Yes, yeah. yes, and very, very awe inspiring as well. Oh yeah. Um, and um, and so uh, yes, the marginalia. What I discovered is uh, a lot of the strains that um, um, we usually associate with the 18th century. That is the interest in characters, the interest in plots, um, in particular um um and other aspects um were already there in in the 16th and 17th century mm -hmm. um the 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 marginalia reveals that that um uh so and so was interested in that character and and um or uh in in uh, in that topic as well usually we think of well topical um uh topical subjects appearing really uh, uh, in the 18th century and certainly mm -hmm. we think as the of the 18th century as the invention of the character or more or less um and and it's not at all the case uh they they had a very 16th to 17th century readers especially 17th century readers had a a, a deep interest in characters so yeah. you can see the continuity there the 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 18th the early 18th century or the augustan period if you, if you like uh yeah. didn't really invent but it was a a um a continuous process of yeah. of um of of interest in 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 this um and there was also a third category of of readers um those who were interested in the text and yeah. who sometimes corrected the text who compared editions etc well we're and... kind of in we're into your book a little bit and i wanted to make sure the title came out to uh, shakespeare's early readers and uh it sounds to me like you're going into the idea of the self uh so people finding themselves in these texts or finding something revealing uh, at this particular point yes yes um i noticed that english history plays were 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 for, far more attractive to um early readers yeah um, very early um, at, at contemporary yeah. with shakespeare yeah yes yes Those... some of the tragedies as well but but what is left aside, and certainly as as we move into the seventeenth century, is comedies, because uh -huh. people people cease to understand the jokes because the English language has you know has evolved, and they don't get the jokes. Um, so it's only after, and and thanks to also the restoration, of course, that that. That um, for better and for worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, the, so the restoration from 1660 onwards, um, the, the um, it was thanks to them who were actually the, the 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 writers at the time who pilfered Shakespeare, but also um, made his comedies popular again because. Um, Shakespeare ceased to be easily readable, um, apart from his history plays and some of his tragedies, already by the end of the 17th century. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's no, um, uh, there's no complex to be developed. <laughs> if you're, uh, you know, if you're an early reader, I'm not talking about you, um, yeah. because you, you're a specialist. But you know, you shouldn't be in awe. Because people already in the 17th century were struggling with, which in the late 17th century were struggling with, um, with, 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 with Shakespeare's writing, with his vocabulary, with his jokes that didn't work anymore. And so 
what remained was um was was the history plays and the the history plays um remained in particular and now we're getting into the 18th century because yeah. of the national well the so-called nationalist strain that was seen in in some of the plays or was um detected uh brought forward out out um outlined by um people who were, were often polemicists yeah. and um i'm thinking of king john you know passages in king john um henry the fifth of course yeah. um that's that's a real biggie um and of course this this goes this goes uh, more as we go more and more into the 18th century and there's a kind of as you know um there's a kind of fight between french taste classical taste um and a a more um nationalistic no national vernacular um after all this is the time when when dr johnson was um writing his dictionary of the english language so um he was establishing english as, as something that that had not been established before uh, whereas the the uh the the um academy francaise predates um which establishes french uh as a language was uh, predates johnson's um 1765 i think dic dictionary mm -hmm. and of course he produced an, an edition as well and um of shakespeare's works but um it was um it was a time when um vernacular language uh, uh people became proud of shakespeare um uh, because he seemed to um illustrate the uh and as as the feud in the background between uh, france and and england um grew more and more especially towards the end of the 18th century yeah. um shakespeare was very much on the on the four on the on the four stage well, a lot of people put him on the four stage really because he you know had no idea of <laughs> well, how his, his works were going to be used but he was well, used for that yeah if, i find if, i find this very interesting that and the way i was schooled uh you're going in a little bit of a different direction and i like it because i think you're right because because of the aforementioned material base the the nature of your research but uh i mentioned before that i'm kind of jealous of a pure research position actually i love teaching i do not love the administration that goes along with it yes. but i do love the actual uh classroom but to you're talking about the yeah the continuity of humor now probably some is lost but the continuity in through to the 18th century when you're trying to teach 12th night to a Japanese uh first language Japanese classroom and trying to explain the jokes well first of all you kill the joke by explaining it second of all I don't know I'm I'm lost in some of the humor that's just you know back and forth and very yes not just that play many uh many jokes in some ways the tragedies and the histories are easier uh but uh what the way I was taught was that okay you have Dryden and then later you have Johnson Pope whatever uh and they're looking back and they're saying oh this guy was okay but he was you know he needs a haircut uh he's a little bit you know, <laughs> he, he's a little bit of a wild man here and we need to make it more refined more neoclassical with our heroic couplets and and refine this verse but you kind of are arguing that no, there's a continuity here, and then uh, in the end, if there's any criticism, and there was of Sh of Shakespeare's forms, oh yes, Sh Shakespeare won in the end. I mean, yes, that, he did. According, according to Samuel Schoenbaum, you know, the great that's when he that's the era of bardolatry. Uh, yes. Shakespeare wins that. So you're seeing a, a continuity, whereas other critics may have see. Uh, the 18th century, Restoration 18th century, is viewing the pre-Civil War period, let's say, as um, the prior age, you know, before we became more, you know, refined, maybe like the French, uh, and, you know, started following some neoclassical rules. 
I, I like that. I like that emphasis because there has to be linguistic. When you look at it, there had to be linguistic and cultural continuity. Not that much changed. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I mean, I, I did find um, some marginalia just saying, well, what's the, you know, what's the joke here? You know, I uh, I don't understand the joke, you know, okay. or, or um, um, this is a very poor joke. Um, this, you know, and, um, and, and of course, writers saying, well, um, we no longer understand Shakespeare, you know, in, in especially his comedies. Um, but really, if just to go back to the end of the 18th century, uh, we mustn't forget women, and women were very, very influential, especially somebody called Elizabeth Montagu, who mm -hmm. fought throughout our life and through her famous salon and the blue stockings and uh, movement, who um, fought for, for a Shakespeare that was an untended garden, but a, a beautiful one. Voltaire mm -hmm. was is also another figure one should mention because he spans the whole of the 18th century, really. And he uh, was in exile for three years in England, and then that's where he dis discovered um, Shakespeare. And um, he quite liked it. Um, well, you have a recent uh, article in this, and this feeds into your... Uh, French Anglo, uh, that, that that portion of your research, and you talk, you focus on Voltaire, and Voltaire is swinging back and forth. Of course, depending on the political circumstances, the the, yes. mutual, the, the war, uh, it, you know, it, it was hard for um, a, a French person to love the English uh, in uh, periods in there. Uh, however. He has this appreciation, but he doesn't want Shakespeare thrown up to the level of Racine. And, and exactly, you know, right? Okay, let, let's let's back off on some of this bardolatry a bit. He's really good. So uh, I, I love that article. How Voltaire sort of switches back and forth. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, there's the early Voltaire and the late later Voltaire, who becomes a bit more of a conservative. And um, and who, um, although an admirer of Shakespeare, and certainly an admirer of of of, of British institutions, um, because of course he was kicked out of France. Certainly, the political system was 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 far less advanced than the the, the British system or the English system, and um, he had a, he had a lot of admiration for that, and he was very curious to discover discover Shakespeare and and he thought well this could actually you know um add some some gist some um um uh, interesting uh elements more lively elements into classical theater but you still he was still you know but he could see the boring side of classical French classical theater yeah. and he thought well a little bit a, bit, a little bit more folly would 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 be good um and then of course there's there's this there's this sentence where you know he goes overboard but he, he's a man who easy he goes overboard um and um uh, the, i think he says there must be a few um i'm misquoting there but um um there must there must be a few pearls in in that um in, in that pile of manure to, to talk about Shakespeare. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Um, and so that, that was one of the unfortunate um, sayings by Voltaire. And so, um, yes, just to go back to Elizabeth Montagu, she was really a, a really big figure in the, in the, in the literary circles. Yeah. And she made sure that the, the Shakespeare became representative almost too much because she was very nationalistic as well yeah. so there are two sides she did it for nationalistic reasons but also for for reasons that you know she does have an she does have um she, as you know she she corresponds a, a lot and um, she has exchanges with a number of people who are who, who find shakespeare too untended 
um, and um, she has to come up with, you know, the defense of of, of this garden uh, that, that Shakespeare created, where the plants were left to um, to grow naturally, and 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 not like the uh, very tender plants grown in in um, glass houses at the Chateau de Marly, you know, uh, yes. and that was really uh, um, against the French. Um, and that was this, that was her way of, of showing that, that, that you know, it, it, it might be untended and, and um, uh, it might be, um, uh, it, 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 it might be less, uh, it, it it certainly is not neoclassical, but yeah. but at, at that time, even the neoclassicals in France, in France, they they changed. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> they yeah, changed the, the absolutely no. perfect neoclassical garden, right? Which at some points, when you reach that kind of perfection, you lose something, right? And uh, exactly that uh, if it's a garden, an actual garden, or if you're using it. Uh, as an analogy for uh, whatever a literary stance, you you do want something wild in there, unpredictable, uh, and exactly going uh, a, a little bit crazy here and there. Uh, I I can see I can see that dynamic, and uh, and that that element, and it, yes, there's a French neoclassicism, and there's the British neoclassicism. But when you look under just a little bit, just look under the hood of that vehicle whatever uh you get these guys like sheridan congreve you get uh, a lot of ra raucous i mean the drama oh, yes. it just went you know it's formulaic yeah. it just yeah. but brilliant stuff um and i don't want the ones aping the french no yeah. they weren't aping the french in, in, in no way uh, and uh, yeah sorry i interrupted you no, no, no. That's uh, I'm trying to th go back into the early modern period, uh, where I'm very interested in the uh, material base for this explosion in drama in the Shakespearean period, but before Shakespeare, which I think can be identified to a few accidents, uh, cultural accidents, uh, in in huh. some way, or at least unintended outcomes of um of things uh that well reformation involved a lot of destruction of property in london and that and a lot of it was absolutely reckless and it it led to and i won't go into the whole whole business but it led to yes. kind of flourishing of the print industry and then from that these dramatists started drawing from it and as you point out in your book more people could read and the playwrights know this and they know the stories that are in circulation and bam, put it on stage. You know, if Mario Puzo writes this book about this Italian crime family, pick it up, throw it onto the screen, right? Because we already have a base here of, you know, readership and so forth. They knew how to do that. And I don't see the same thing happening in France or in really on the continent. Uh, there might be some isolated cases, but it seemed that the drama stayed Oh, the, the sum result is it goes all the way from the aristocracy to the common person who who can, it, it, you know, at least even if not literate, heard the story from a friend who is uh, or what David Cressy, you uh, cite frequently, yes, uh, whose, yes. whose work I just love, uh, calls the semi-literate. You know, we, we can't discount that. Hey, tell me the story. You went to see the movie. I couldn't see the movie. You know, I'm old enough to remember where if you missed a movie, you missed a movie. It was going to be a, yes, long, a yes. long time. You know, you couldn't stream it. Uh, so please tell me what happened, you know, and a good storyteller can do that. And then you want to see the play. I don't see this happening in France, but I want to ask you, do you see it happening, say, in uh, the late 16th, early 17th century in French theater, where it sort of opens up, let's say, in Paris for um, for the, the general public and the same play played for them could be played to the, you know, um, to the court. Well, there's the case of Moliere. Um, yes. There's a case of Moliere, but that's, that's a little later, of course, in the, in the 17th century. But Moliere is, is somebody who, who had a uh, popular appeal, an extremely popular appeal 
who played to you know in in, in popular theater theaters and um who was also very sought for at the court and um and i think that um uh that could be an example uh of course my colleagues my my colleagues who are specialized in uh in, in uh 17th century theatre um, uh, would know far more than than, than I do, but but the, the immediate uh, figure that that comes up is, is Molière. Yeah, um, certainly. Racine yeah. was was very much um, revered as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a neoclassicist. Um, he, he wrote in Alexandrines. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that correct pronunciation? Alexandrines. <laughs> I, I think it's as, it's as correct as yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and um, is it's true that it's it's um, it's sometimes daunting for school children today, but it, it if you really get into it, it it's quite beautiful. Yeah, uh, and Corme as well. But um, they were they were not as popular. Um, Sonia Racine was not a popular. Uh, it, it was more um, it was more like court theater um, yeah. than, than popular um, theater. Now there must be, I'm sure my colleagues would correct me on on that because there must be one dramatist who was um, both popular and also well sort of in in the court circles, uh, not just like Racine and and, and Cornet. Um, but uh, but as I say, Moliere is the typical example of of somebody who could play on different levels, right. um, like Shakespeare. I mean, after all, Shakespeare was 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 part of um, uh, well, um, what you would call the inte intelligentsia, or um, the. Um, he played on both on both both uh, accounts. He was he was a popular dramatist, um, playing in in the first well popular theaters, and um, not private um, venues, and also someone who um, was approved by the court. After all, to the king's man, the queen's man. Um, and 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 this proves that there, there's a stamp put on uh, and you only have to read um, Andrew Gurr's book to see that um, often the city doesn't like Shakespeare or doesn't like theater, but the court puts pressure on the city to accept that to, they put pressure and they say, no, you're going to perform that play because we want this play to be performed. And they knew they they knew very well how to to play court against city. <laughs> so. Yeah, but you know when I think of the explosion, I'm also thinking of the venues, the uh, theater curtain, the globe, the rose, the portion. Yes, you know I I don't see that popping up in any major uh, metropolis at that time. And I, again, I could be wrong. As far as I know, and somewhere in in Belgium, there was something like that going on, but. Uh, the uh, and that other playwrights beyond Shakespeare too. Uh, I'm interested. Uh, I don't know why. Reading your work, uh, rereading uh, your your book, uh, I thought about Ben Johnson because there you have a guy who had a lot of popular appeal and had these jokes that apparently kept people in stitches and so forth. But <laughs> just uh, Johnson to me is just so forbiddingly difficult. Yes. Uh, and he had this. Uh, he had a, a pre-neoclassical bent in him. You know, he wanted to preserve some of the uh, whatever the the forms of the old, uh, the the ancient. Yes. Uh, yes. So maybe that is why Johnson didn't win the day in the same way Shakespeare did. Uh, brilliant stuff, you know. Brilliant. Yes, I, you but, might have been too much of a scholar, perhaps. But I, that's you know. Um, and uh, and 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 his way of writing. I, I know there's a. I once spoke to somebody from um, the the RSC had a voice um, department and um, and asked asked um, asked him whether um, on, on the difference between Johnson and Shakespeare. Well, 
it's when I work with actors which with Shakespeare, they're obviously, you know, daunted because, you know, it's the apex of a career to be to be playing Shakespeare. But but um when they come to Johnson, I can see their 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 eyes glaze. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't understand what they're saying you know it's it's just beyond them it's not it, it's not stuff that is easily um put into words and 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 for the voice department of the rsc it was a very very big challenge johnson was a very big challenge he's and very it, inside his humor even when he's being raucous and on yes the the city references and so forth, almost as if you had to be there. You know, the, the joke that- Yes, you had to yes, be there it, to get, in, in joke, yes, or, yes. Or know um, uh, a lot about the type of courtier he's making fun of and so forth. I'm thinking of every man out of his humor. Uh, there's nothing off-putting about that. There's a lot of great humor in there, but you have to know a lot to, yes, to get yes. the joke. Yeah. Um, just to go back about your point about, you know, European theaters, I, I think um, uh, you would have to look at possibly Italy as an example, and the uh, comedy of the latte, and the use also of um, not so much theatres as such, but various venues used for, for theatre mm -hmm. uh, very early with Italian um, playwrights. Yeah. And um, as we know, Italians um were were far more well this is a tele teleological view of history i which i don't like but <laughs> but, but <laughs> uh, i was going to say advanced no um they 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 had a different renaissance which was earlier yeah. and and i i think that um their their, their theaters certainly sprouted uh, much earlier than ours well, hours I was saying, yeah, and let's, let's go, let's go the opposite way from teleology. Let's just face it, they had good stories, and somebody wrote those stories down. And in one case, those stories are translated into French, the French love the stories, they're translated into English, the exactly the English love the stories, and then the playwrights pick up from the stories. You can just see exactly, Bella Farce, exactly back to the Italian and you know th they wrote down their stories and they had some great stories of yes. course the French the French did too and yes. uh, and that's uh that that's it just became kind of a feeder uh into the London stage and uh even yes yes uh, yeah no it, it would be a mistake to on a, a European level to um to not to see the circulation of texts yeah. and and the the translation or the, the polyglossia of uh, at work uh, throughout europe and the and the circulation of of taste uh, uh, which brings me to another influence of of mine which uh, the historian roger chartier who um did some very good work of himself and who's also worked with peter salibras as well and who's, yeah. who's, who's a brilliant guy as well as we know the, the circulation i mean we okay england is an island etc but but the um the idea that we've got of, of a very contained um uh country is is totally wrong um and um, there were circulate not only circulating tastes but also circulating artists and circulating artists from the netherlands from yeah. italy there were also people who were doing their European tour and bringing back books. Um, oh, yes, Milton, uh, yeah, yeah, John Milton, uh, and you wonder if uh, he didn't just draw Eve from um, Raphael. Uh, you know, you you wonder. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe I don't know. I, I had a student I wanted to go. She she was going to Italy, but I wanted to mention too, even Ovid, even uh, uh, Virgil, all of that. You know, can be credited to yes. the Italians, but. But also, I was talking about this boom in theater. The continent was huge in terms of its publishing in industry. England was small, 
And any historian yes. of the book will just say that, you know, it was a province in terms of what was going on, you know, from uh, uh, Strasbourg to on up to just all the way up through there in terms of the major publishing centers, of course, that were uh, uh, ignited and charged by religious writing early on. And then, yes, that, well, that's that, is that, structure. Is, that is true that um, English printing was was. Um, not as productive as um, as as um, uh, continental and certainly French, but that has to do also with the fact that um, the um, the English had to import paper from Normandy. Mm -hmm. The machines they used to print were were also a little old fashioned, mm -hmm. and um, actually uh, we also we will we all think of. The Great Fire of 1660 as being in London as being a great great, great catastrophe, which it was. It really but was. Um, but it, it it forced actually printers to buy material, the latest um, printing material from the continent, mm -hmm. and from then on they could compete. Uh -huh. And paper mills started as well, but there were fewer paper mills. That is true than um than paper mills on the continent um yeah. and paper had to be imported in, in reams um and rolled up and and um etc so yeah there's there's this problem of of this this dearth of of, of paper really a problem of te technology but that stops being the case as i say in the 1660s where um the Printers could certainly compete, and in the 18th centuries, in the 18th century, um, they, they competed so much that, that they sold um, <laughs> some some um, uh, um, some theatre directors chose to print the pawn book before the play was performed. Oh, mm -hmm. And so, and it was it was even sold um, uh, during well before the performance started. But you could also um, so you could you you could there were there were three markets really. There, were, there was a market during well before the, the performance started, as you would buy a program these days. But this time you would you know you would buy the whole um, <clears throat> the whole book. Um, there was a pre market which was meant to draw people to theater um but also to the to that was circulated to the provinces um of plays that, that had not been um uh, performed yet but um that were supposed to lure these publications were supposed to lure uh, people into going into the theater and then there was a market afterwards um of the there was very important to um spread shakespeare through um throughout england and uh, through or should i say throughout britain um uh, great britain um and um and that was some clever clever ventures by uh, a number of um uh, of 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 printers who some of them well, use pirated editions <laughs> the, yeah. who circulated um, the play as it was played by etc. Yeah. And and you could see you can in some of these plays, as I'm sure you're aware, you can see the passages. I mean, it, it, in a way, it, it goes it goes against the practices of the readers because the readers used to put quotation marks next to the passages that they liked. Well, in those books, they put quotation marks for passages that were um, uh, cut in performance. You see, um, so you you could go, you could or supposedly cut in performance, because what happens is when you study these books, you um, you realize that that other companies in in everywhere in England actually use these books to, to re-perform Shakespeare. And if you take a, a good look at them, you can see that the passages that were crossed out are reintroduced or not. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the things were added as well. These texts served as as a basis for any dramatist, for any company to create their own plays. Yeah. And that I find really um, exciting uh, as well. But that, that's another kind of study. Um, it's, 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 it's a study on, on print, of course, and yeah. on the circulation of print and, and on the, um, uh, the reappropriation and I'd like to say that, that we were talking about appropriation. I have this theory that, that and maybe I'm wrong, but um, <laughs> uh, I have this theory that, that, that every, that, that all reception really is appropriation yeah. Um, yeah. in some regards. There are, of course, there are degrees in the appropriation, yeah. but, but, but uh, every piece of, of of because if you if you choose a passage um, in a book was well, because you have a um, a kind of horizon of expectation as Hans Hobart uh, Jaus would say, but um, but it's also because it touches a chord or it's or it's something it's certainly in very early readers. You find them um, because they've been taught at school to spot similes and and rhetorical figures. Um, you can see them. That's a case in of, of Edward Putsey's, for example, Edward Putsey's um, uh, manuscripts, where you could see in the margin simile, you know, and he put metaphor, or uh, you know, he um, and um, <clears throat> a lot of people also used um shakespeare's uh, but that then brings us in the whole area of of um manuscripts to shakespeare yeah. and excerpts um a lot of excerpts were uh what you call purple passages but not always they were they were also used by priests yeah um and as as you know just to to liven up their uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in the 18th the, century in the 18th century the beauties i think the uh, collections of beauty yes. come out with the uh, nuggets of wisdom and so forth i'm yes. sorry i used the wrong word earlier in our talk when i uh, i said um Adaptation, I think, instead of appropriation, uh, I'm working with the student now on uh, adaptation in uh, Japanese. Theater. Oh, that's quite different. And, yes, and, uh, yes. And it's well, it's quite different. But there is a kind of appropriation that occurs in adaptation because you're trying to bring it into uh, a yes that understands. Yes. So, uh, I was dealing with those two words just today, looking over her writing, um, and uh, and so I wanted to correct that. Yes, and. Uh, adaptation isn't as encoded as appropriation can be a very vexing issue particularly in terms of modern times you know to to what extent you know you, you can do it i mean you have to uh try to make something relevant to your audience if you're a theater in theater or yes. if, you're, if you're writing or if you're in translation but i did want to jump a little bit to translation because i'm assuming uh that uh, Jean Christophe was born in a French speaking environment and may have encountered Shakespeare first through the French language, right? Is that, am I right there or? Um, not quite actually, because um, I remember as a child, my, my mother was, was in France um, because we're, we're from, from the Nice area in yeah. the southeast of France. Yeah. I remember my, my mother studying for her BA in English because originally she she had a BA in German from Royal Holloway, Royal Holloway and she so she had to completely um, change in order to be able to to have a degree to, to teach in, teach English as a foreign language in France and one of the set plays was the Tempest and I could hear her um, speaking you know whole passages aloud of the tempest and talking about the characters in english and um and i'd never i don't think i'd, I'd opened a, a, a translation of of shakespeare before that even though my parents funnily enough 
uh, my grand my English grandparents lived at Sh 62 Shakespeare Drive. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You were, you were destined. Was, <laughs> you, know. was, you had no choice. <laughs> I don't think either of them had, had read Shakespeare, but um, um, they had other worries of of um, of, of their um, of their own, yeah. and uh, and maybe I'm wrong actually. Um, but anyway, yes, my first encounter with Shakespeare was The Tempest, and it's still, I think, yeah. one of the easiest plays. To correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the easiest plays to um, to teach, and one of the most lovable uh, pieces of, of of writing, and it's often a set a set play for undergraduates in in France. Yeah. So my first encounter was oral. Yeah, the the Tempest. You know, if we could somehow separate the the text of the play or performance and so forth, uh, is uh, just a <laughs> it's it's become a uh, a little bit of a it, it, there's a lot of gunpowder under the play now in oh, terms yes. of, uh, uh, modern. Uh, I was talking with uh, James Shapiro uh, a little over a year ago about uh, how the uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, a famous uh, Harvard lawyer or whatnot, in the turn of the 20th century in in America, uh, used the play to as an argument to hold back, push back on immigration. Uh, what we would now consider to be so uh, oh. and how in more recent studies has become adopted by post-colonial theorists to uh, to feature you know how the um let's say dominant dominant class views of a character like Caliban and yes and yes. Prospero is not yes. yeah so uh the play just works itself through these circuits of uh of consciousness but then that's what you do when you're looking at readers here. At the Horizons of expectations. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I wanted to kind of uh, move toward closing. Uh, I do sure. want to focus a little bit more. Uh, you write in, uh, you write in French, you pu publish in French and in English. Yes. And, uh, move fluidly between those two languages. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, well, I'll just uh, an anecdote. A friend of mine who was at an American elite university getting his PhD years ago in another century uh, found uh, there was a student, a French woman, uh, to whom he uh, he he felt that he he might try to ask out for a date, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> he was Good for him. And he he, uh, he very mistakenly took her to Kenneth Branagh's years ago. Kenneth Branagh's uh, Henry V. <laughs> Which, yeah, to say, nothing happened there that nothing ignited uh he i don't think he got a, a second date there um a, a bad mistake but bad, know, bad. The French, <laughs> you know, the French of henry the fifth and these uh speaking of um appropriations uh you know uh, or stereotyping uh french aristocrats and so forth in this place uh I would just like to hear how how you manage uh, your interest in uh, Anglo uh, French, uh, uh, the Anglo French elements in Shakespeare, and you know we can start with Henry the Fifth, but we can uh, move on to other things. Of course, we already mentioned your article on on Voltaire and his relationship with the you know the eighteenth century British. But do you see yourself doing more work in that area? Well, actually, work was done. And um, when I first, when I was first hired, I was given um, a project. Well, I was uh, my supervisor at the um, and um, uh, fr who became a friend, Charles Whitworth, a dear dear friend. Um, um had started a project on Shakespeare and uh, on on um um uh, English drama and and the French so how the French are seen in English drama mm -hmm. so we did a database which unfortunately is no longer online because the um uh it happened that we we I think we had a series of, of Al Qaeda attacks on CNRS um, because it's state related uh, servers so we're trying to rebuild that mm -hmm. but we had a whole team of 15 people to work on uh, on on Shakespeare and and France but also on more generally on English theatre 
and France. So our limits were 1580, if I remember, to 1640. Mm -hmm. And what came out was that on the whole, um, and I say on the whole, because there are <laughs> exceptions that were one of them you mentioned, on the whole, the um, remarks about France tended to be relatively neutral. And that was a surprise to us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they, and of course, there's the French disease, you know, uh, mm -hmm. theme that runs through, through, runs through a lot of plays. Um, there's the, the reputation for, you know, foppery and, and, you know, and overdressing and, and mannerisms and stuff like that. That comes, you know, that, that comes back very, very often. Um, what else um i'm having to um look back but that was that was in in the year 2000 2003 2006 in those years you see so yeah that's uh, a while back that's we, a while back oh we published a book um um it, it's a delaware book um, published by delaware which is actually the fruits of that project. Yes. And, uh, yes. It's, um, it's a collection of articles representing Fra France and the French. And you get everything there. You get syphilis, you get... <laughs> yeah. And you also get praise for the French, yeah. Well, I'm wondering about the converse of that too, what the, uh, uh, the portrayals of the English uh, at that time uh, would have been in France. And uh, if there would have been the same kind of thing going on um or there might be there may have been a sense of continental superiority along all along there through the uh, holy Ro roman empire into france and uh so forth i don't know i just don't know enough about it uh um i don't really know much about it either um other than um you know a kind of french snobbery um that, that is linked to um french neoclassicism and that um um french writers uh tended to look down on on what was not what what did not follow the three rules in you know, the famous classical three rules of time plays <laughs> but i mean looking back though you see that, that uh, elizabeth the younger um, elizabeth was courted by uh you know the, the i mean yes yes yeah, so yes you, yeah, and it was a, yeah it could be very possible a marriage there uh that, that it was something that was reasonably considered it was considered a reasonable choice uh and that would have changed history uh, a lot uh so uh, well, we have that. Uh, I did want to thank you for your involvement as uh, as an editor with a uh, with other editors uh, at um, uh, Kaye uh, Elizabeth uh, Than, the, oh, yes. the journal. Uh, that, That's been quite a, an adventure. Yeah, and uh, it's been uh, it has now uh, in terms of literary journals quite a long history uh, of uh, success yes. uh, in publishing. Thank you. And well, thank you for uh, <laughs> because it, journals have had a hard time uh, in the humanities because oh, it, yes, uh, 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 CEKA uh, has very well adapted to the digital age, and uh, a lot of journals didn't and uh, have suffered as a result uh, in in the humanities. Of course, the science. Yeah. Yes. Uh, social sciences yes. were very quick to do that, but yes, uh, that was that was just done superbly well. Um, well, uh, there's so many other things I would love to... I just just, just, just um, a word about K. I I think, um, yes, yes. I mean, I mean our, our mandate really is to, because we, we had a meeting a few years ago and we thought, well, we have to talk about the identity of, in order to survive, we have to think about the identity of the journal. And, and um, what's our identity? I mean, what purpose do we serve? Well, the purpose we serve is that um, we uh, a, little, a little bit like the um, the the journal that, that escapes me that's from Florence that's also online. Uh, they do a really brilliant job. But but um, our, our mandate really is is to publish um, 
European research in the sense that that can include English research, you know, despite Brexit, I forget Brexit, um, and European research and to showcase it mm-hmm. to, because often um, um, Shakespeare um, research and Shakespeare research in early modern studies has been carried out by um, the top um, Anglo um, American journals, and we wanted to to bring new voices to, and especially voices from Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. And this is why we are very close to um, an association which is called Ezra, the European Research um, Association, and uh, the means twice yearly. And um, we we get a lot of material from uh, from Ezra. So so really, I think that's how we found our place. Because if you look, um, all successful journals are 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 buttressed by an institution. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you know it's Shakespeare Shakespeare Quarterly, it's the um, it, it it's um, uh, obviously the Folger. Shakespeare, Shakespeare Survey is obviously um, the Shakespeare Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shakespeare is the BSA. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we were the only ones really without an association, you know, that made sense. And we thought, well, why not approach Ezra as because uh, a lot of us are part of Ezra, mm-hmm. and uh, and anyway, and so and so we've built up links with with Ezra, and we've we've now got, of course, this means a lot more work in terms of English, mm-hmm. because you know, of course, a uh, people tend to be more or less fluent and uh and so we have our managing editors uh, daniel yabut and um the doctor i should say that dr Dan- daniel yabut who had you had the pleasure, had of, pleasure meeting. of meeting daniel uh, was a in pleasure. barcelona just uh yeah he's a, a great guy yeah. he's a great guy yeah and um dr janet vals russell who yes. who is um now retiring um and who's um teaching all the all that she knows and she knows a lot to to daniel but but he's already on top of the game i think <laughs> so so there we are yes i'm sorry if i if i was a bit over long about about ke but um i wanted to just to situate the oh no this you is you know the... what what you would be getting if you were consulting uh 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 if you were, if you had a, a, a KE either online or if you subscribe to it, um, but I, I would advise to just get a subscription. It's much cheaper. Yeah. Um, and um, that's what you're getting. You're getting special issues on sometimes on on um, Eastern um, uh, adaptations. <laughs> adaptation. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and and we and our latest issue is on Japan. Hot Shakespeare, cool Japan. That's right. Yep. So yeah, we try well, to I have showcase. A little article. I have a little article in there. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're trying to we're trying to showcase you. You know, I mean, why? You know, why not showcase Japan? You know, um, and why not showcase? Um, uh you know you don't have to publish necessarily i mean good for you if you publish in, in if if you want to publish in shakespeare survey or shakespeare quarterly or whatever or or, or shakespeare but um you we we have um we we are here to answer your needs as well, well and very, your propos- very... and your proposals for special issues yeah very very importantly there were japanese scholars including uh uh, my student who, uh, you know, at my point in the career, I'm doing this uh, for the love of it uh, and for the, for the profession, of course. But um, in the younger scholars cases, they need this. They, they need this uh, exposure and international exposure and it, to have a, a journal that reaches out uh, to Japanese scholars. Uh, it's just it's just absolutely wonderful. Uh, and uh, and very helpful to their careers, help them uh, to help them move along the way. Because we we often talk about global Shakespeare, but 
but really what we're talking about is is anglo-american yeah. shakespeare yeah uh, if you if you want to go global uh go 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 global you can go global now um yes. it's it's only africa now but we do have african also um special issues um and um and african scholars publishing with with us so we're quite proud of of, of serving the needs of people whose needs were were not served enough I yes think. yes it's wonderful stuff to do i've tried in this series to to make sure that uh, you can really get into the u.s and the north america and not get out of it i mean there's many uh we all have bubbles. That's normal. There's so but, yeah. many, you know, scholars. And uh, so, you know, I made a, a big point. I've tried to, I begged a couple of my Japanese colleagues. They're kind of shy about uh, English language, uh, speaking uh, long form in English, which I fully understand, you know, having to, having had to do uh, reports here and there in Japanese. Uh, it's, it's scary stuff. But um in terms of getting published, you know, where you have a chance to have something uh, proofread, you know, for idiom or that, that kind of thing. Uh, I, there are many, many scholars out there from other cultures who uh, can can publish. I, I feel a little bit guilty that the English has sort of become the lingua franca, uh, you know, somehow along the way. Uh, but that's the way it is. And there's so much discrimination yes. uh, against uh, scholars. And this is in Europe as well. Uh, that are are not publishing in English, and it's a shame. Uh, you know, there yes. there, there used to be a scholarly consensus, at least in, in European, very Western. That you know, if um, some some major German scholar publishes in German, you better uh, damn well sure make sure you know enough German to read his work, right? Yes, uh, I remember that time. Yes, yeah, and uh, also French, of course. And uh, we had to qualify in these languages in, in my day. Uh, so that that's a problem. We can't solve it here. <laughs> but uh, what we um, uh, can do, though, uh, is is just thank you so much. There's so much else I would love to talk with you about. It's your morning, uh, and it's my supper time, and so uh, I, I, I'm going <laughs> to miss that. <laughs> try to uh, draw this to a close before you know somebody, <laughs> whoever it is, you know comes in and needs need you because I know you're extraordinarily busy. You do so much work in so many different areas. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Jean Christophe, we just want to, to thank you so much. We hope we can uh, keep this going and maybe have you on again to update us on what's going on in uh, your research and also in uh, Montpellier. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes.